um, welcome to Chris Wyman from Oxford, who will give a talk about um, um, a virulent uh, lineage discovered in the Netherlands. And um, as Chris already mentioned, so this was actually work that wasn't going before the pandemic. And, and I vaguely remember that we had a meeting of thinking like how to pitch this work and, and will people actually believe us if, you know, believe that there is a relatively sudden jump in virulence in this lineage. And, and we looked at the literature and there was lots of modeling work, and, uh, but, but not very many examples. There was a rather obscure story of uh, a plane load of rabbits who were flown from Germany to Australia and seemingly um, had a virus that mutated on the plane, but otherwise there wasn't uh, very much in that regard. So um, uh, Chris stopped the work uh, to work on COVID and then went back last year. And uh, I think we all appreciate that now you don't have a problem uh, explaining to the world that a virus could jump in, in virulence. Um, uh, so as we unfortunately found out, but uh, I'll hand over to Chris to tell the story. Thank you very much, Lucy. I'll start sharing my screen. Uh, yeah, thanks very much for the introduction. So we're going to talk about this um, uh, particular variant of subtype B um, HIV that we found um, in the Netherlands. Um, lots of contributing co-authors listed here. Um, some abbreviations that will come up in the, ter uh, in the talk, uh, VL for viral load um, and so on. I'll just give you a moment to read these uh, in the middle at the bottom. Um, and there's also a website um, with a link to the paper and some, uh, some more accessible explanation and some links to other things um, shown on the right of the page here. Or you can just, if you Google Beehive HIV, um, you find the website and you can click through from there. Um, so when this, uh, this uh, paper came out, um, the beginning of February, I think now, um, it was front page news in the Netherlands and received some coverage from a number of other newspapers. Uh, for example, BBC World Service uh, did an interview with Christoph and me that you can listen to if you want. Um, and UNAIDS put out a press release. Um, uh, I've, I'm quoting them at the bottom here saying this uh, provides urgency, uh, provides evidence of the urgency to halt the pandemic and reach everybody with uh, testing and treatment. Um, so the, uh, here's some of the coverage. So let me uh, tell you um, what it was that we found. Starting with some background, um, so just a very uh, quick recap of the uh, sort of typical progression of an untreated uh, HIV infection. Um, so in red here is viral load, which peaks, uh, goes up to a, a, a very large value in the weeks immediately following infection. Um, and then the immune system starts to get a control of the virus and viral load comes down again to a value which is not absolutely stable, but relatively stable. Um, over a period of time called a set point window um, and the viral load during that phase is called the set point viral load um, and then it would eventually start increasing again uh, during AIDS um, and shown in blue here is a cartoon of CD4 cell count over the course of the infection um, and the main thing to draw attention to it is just that it typically decreases overall um, over the course of the infection. Um, and I'm going to be referring both to CD4 cell decline um, and to set point viral load um, as measures of virulence. So just roughly speaking, how much is the virus uh, damaging the health um, of the person it's in? Um, so the insight, uh, insight start trial um, told us um, something we uh, something very important about treatment, which is that even though treatment reverses uh, it stops CD4 cell decline from progressing um, and CD4 cell counts can recover thereafter. They don't recover all the way back to normal um, such that it doesn't matter when you start treatment so long as you do. There is a benefit to be gained by starting treatment as early as possible. Um, so this was a randomized trial with patients in two groups. Um, those who started CD4, sorry, those who started um, ART immediately upon diagnosis. Uh, and those whose uh, initiation was deferred until their CD4 count declined to 350. Um, and then in comparing those two groups, um, there, was a, there was a risk of about two to four times uh, uh, greater chance of having um, serious events in the groups that started um, treatment later. So starting treatment before your CD4 count declines to 350 um, is of noticeable clinical benefit. A bit of background about genetic diversity. 
Um, the pie charts here are the, the size of the pie chart is proportional to the number of people living with HIV in that region. Um, and the color of each pie chart um, is showing the, the fractions of different uh, HIV subtypes um, in that region. And so this uh, shows what probably uh, everybody already knows, not just that the number of people living with HIV is very variable around the world, um, but also the, the, the dominant genetic diversity in each particular place varies as well. Um, and in Europe and North America, um, subtype B is most common. Um, and in, uh, in Europe, uh, as well as other places, uh, for example, the US, um, there have been reports of set point viral loads increasing over time, particularly um, sort of during the 90s and the 2000s. Um, and uh, so there, are, there have been questions about, is this just due to evolution as opposed to changes in something uh, relating to the people themselves? Um, and it's possible that it is evolution because the virus, uh, the virus itself plays some role in determining virulence. Um, so this was uh, um, sort of mainly determined by Christoph over a number of years, working with a number of collaborators. Um, but sort of he really led the sort of uh, led the charge in the community coming to this conclusion that the virus is important for virulence. And this started with with a, a, by putting a couple of observations together, um, namely that uh, infectiousness shown in blue. Uh, on the plot here uh, increases with uh, with viral load which makes sense if you've got more virus you have more risk of, of transmitting it to somebody in any given um, interaction where you might do that um, and also as viral load increases the time it takes until you progress to AIDS decreases and that makes sense as well because it, the virus is imposing a bigger burden on your immune system um, and the product of those two things so the amount of time before you reach AIDS and the rate at which you transmit the virus um, gives you a sort of reproduction number, something slight, slightly different, but closely related called the transmission potential, um, which is basically the number of people one person is expected to pass the virus onto um, during their chronic phase. Um, and the product of those two things gives you something which peaks in the middle. So it's people with intermediate viral loads who are expected to pass the virus on to more people. Um, and if you then um, compare that theoretical expectation for the, for the transmission potential to what's most common in the population in, in the bottom plot here, you see that they coincide. Now that's either coincidence or it's indicative that the virus has already evolved to maximize its fitness. And that would imply that it is um, controlling its own viral load because it's reached the viral load which, which uh, is selected for. Um, so that was sort of indirect evidence that uh, the virus is controlling virulence. And then in follow-up studies, um, Christoph and, and our team and other people um, uh, have shown this more directly as well. So that brings us to the Beehive Project, of which uh, Christoph is the PI. Um, this started in 2014 after a, a certain amount of work setting it up and all the power calculations and so on, um, bringing all the data together. So Beehive is a, uh, is a project, the primary aim of which um, is to better understand how genetic variability in the virus um, uh, affects virulence. So are there specific mutations, um, specific you know, uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms where one base changes into another or other kinds of genetic features such as insertions or deletions? Um, are there, are there um, aspects of genetic variability um, which are linked to virulence? Um, so that's the main aim of Beehive and there are two other um, sort of uh, there are secondary and tertiary objectives. Um, it's about 3,700 3, individuals are involved. Um, uh, so we have samples for those individuals and we generated whole, uh, whole genome sequencing data and there's detailed clinical data available as well. Um, they're all seroconverters, so they're people who are identified early on in their infection, um, which of course reduces the amount of uh, data that we could have considered, um, but means it's a more like-for-like -like comparison given that it's not confounded by progression towards a late stage of the disease. Um, and we have, yes, we have early samples for these individuals um, and early viral load measurements. And sorry, I forgot to say as well, this is a, a predominantly European cohort, um, also with some uh, contributions from Ugandan samples from the Rakai cohort. Um, lots of people involved in Beehive. Uh, uh, thank you to everybody. Of course, thank you to the, the patients who uh, consented to provide their data. Um, the people whose names I've highlighted in blue um, played a particularly large role in, in this particular study. And um, thank you to those. And thanks to the funders, uh, the ERC um, and the Li Ka-Shing Foundation for the grants they've awarded to Christoph um, to fund this work. Uh, so what did we discover in Beehive? 
Um, we found uh, 17 individuals, 15 of whom uh, were Dutch, one was Swiss, one was Belgian, um, who all had uh, a virus um, similar to each other and quite different from the rest of the viruses in the data set. Um, it was a subtype B virus. Um, and these 17 individuals had a set point viral load, which is quite a lot higher than the average for the rest of the data set. So their set point viral load was 5.84 log 10 copies per mil um, compared to 5.10 um, for everybody else. Um, so we, uh, th this virus that these individuals had, we called the, the VB variant for virulent subtype B. Um, so that is of course, uh, you know, the term VB refers to the virus itself um, but in a slight abuse of, uh, of terminology, we're also using it to refer to the individuals who have that virus, um, just because we're going to be comparing um, in this study individuals who have this virus to individuals who have any other virus. And so just for convenience, we're going to say VB individuals, that means people with the VB virus, um, to not VB individuals, which means individuals with other viruses. So that was what we first found. Um, so that was looking only within Beehive, which is, is restricted to zero converters, um, but has data from, um, I think it's eight or eight or nine different European countries, as well as the Rakai cohort. Um, and then given that 15 of the 17 individuals we found with this specific variant were Dutch, um, we wanted to know, um, is there more, uh, are there more instances of this virus in the broader Dutch data set? Because we'd only been looking at the zero converters. Um, from the Athena cohort. So the Athena cohort is the Dutch data set. Um, so working in, in particular with Daniela uh, Bezema, um, I examined a lot of um, the, the full Dutch data set of subtype B sequences anyway. So we had a new data sharing agreement, um, Christoph and Daniela and Peter Rice and I um, um, uh, talked about and put in place so that we could look at the whole Dutch data set. Um, and in doing that, so looking at the non-zero converters as well, uh, we found 92 more individuals uh, with this virus. And then, uh, so looking at this uh, expanded data set, um, and initially to, to look at viral load, to have an independent test um, of the one we'd already done, I discarded all of the beehive patients. So I looked only at the new individuals we hadn't seen already. Um, and then looking just at those individuals and doing a straightforward comparison of the viral load between individuals with this virus and individuals with any other virus, um, we saw again that there was a, a significantly increased uh, viral load. So now 4.79 log 10 copies versus 5.33. Um, and that's also plotted here um, for, for all of the individuals we know with this virus or with something else um, over time. And I've just grouped them into, into four different categories along the x-axis um, according to the amount of data we have, but it's going from earlier times to later times um, as we go along that x-axis. And you can see this effect is stable over time uh, as well. Um, so then, uh, then I looked at the CD4 decline um, associated with this patient, with, uh, sorry, with this virus um, using a linear mixed model. So it's a linear model of CD4 decline. So if you let Y be CD4 cell count and X be years since diagnosis, it's not years since infection because we typically don't know that for these individuals, uh, but it's years since diagnosis. So we have Y equals MX plus C, a linear decline of CD4 cell, uh, cell count over time. Um, and in the statistical model, we allow um, M and C, so the slope, the rate of decline, uh, and the intercept to be different for VB or not VB, that's a, a fixed effect, to be different for males and females, to be different for each age category, um, to be different for different viral loads, assuming a linear effect of uh, log viral load on the overall um, CD4 decline. And we also allow M and C to be different for every individual. Um, now we don't estimate every individual's parameters completely independently. Um, that, that variability between individuals is modeled as a random effect, um, which means that we assume there's normal, uh, normally distributed variation between individuals. Um, and we estimate the sort of the, the scale of that variation um, integrating over what the actual differences between people are. So we're really just trying to estimate what is the level of variability between, uh, between different people. Uh, I tried the same model where instead of Y being um, uh, CD4 cell counts, it was the square root transform, transform of that, uh, which is a transform commonly used in this kind of CD4 cell analysis um, to, to improve model fit. I didn't, found, I didn't find that it improved the model in this case. Um, and I also applied the same model 
um, not to CD4 cell counts, but to CD4 percentages. So um, when you take a blood sample, you take all of the um, T cells and, you've, and you calculate the fraction of them that express CD4. Um, so it's, uh, it's the same model applied to two different, two different data sources. Uh, uh, yeah, so this is just showing, it's, it's really just one line using this convenient R package for implementing the statistical model I just described. Um, here are the results uh, coming out of that analysis. So there's four rows in this table. Um, uh, there are two rows for the two different kinds of data I've just described, CD4 cell counts versus CD4 percentages. Um, and for each of those two kinds of data, I've used two different models, one where I adjust for viral load and one where I don't. So one of them is just giving the raw overall association between this virus um, and the CD4 cell decline. And the other one is telling you how different is it adjusting for the fact that, that, uh, that these patients also have a viral load, which already tells you you'd expect uh, faster decline. Um, so the, uh, the third column here is showing you what's the rate of decline uh, in, the, in the reference category of patients. So what's the average for, 30, for, for males diagnosed in their 30s? And then the final column here is what's the additional decline associated with this virus. And just a broad thing to, to, to notice here is those two columns are quite similar to each other, which is the same as saying that this virus is associated with a doubling um, in CD4 cell decline. So it gives you the extra rate of decline on top of what you would already see. So it's about twice as fast. Uh, and uh, when you compare that to the variability in CD4 cell decline um, that's associated with variable viral loads, that size of an effect is what you'd expect from having a viral load three log 10 copies higher. So it's way higher than, um, than what's explained by the actual increase in viral load we see. Um, and this is just showing um, the expected CD4 cell decline on average um, for that reference, reference category. So it's men diagnosed in their 30s, um, comparing uh, those with this virus and those without. Um, the dotted line here is just showing a CD4 cell count of 350. So I mentioned earlier that um, when individuals are only started on treatment, when they've reached that stage of progression already, which is a, a stage the WHO refers to as advanced HIV, um, that's associated with appreciably worse clinical outcomes. Um, and reaching that stage on average is expected to take about nine months for individuals with this virus compared to 36 months for individuals with other viruses. And, it's, and this is for, for men in their 30s, it gets progressively quicker um, the older people are. So they're starting from a, a lower CD4 count. Um, I used a very, uh, very similar kind of statistical model to look at CD4 cell recovery after starting treatment, um, just using um, a, a square root transform this time to, to improve model fit um, and found no, no association between uh, whether or not individuals have this virus and what their CD4 cell recovery was. Um, and as well as using that statistical model, um, I also tested a patient matching procedure, um, which only uses a, a small fraction of the data, but ought to be more robust against model misspecification. Um, and again, saw the same thing, that there was no, no, no appreciable difference between the, uh, people who have this virus and people who don't. Um, now just doing a survival analysis um, on, on literal survival, so looking at mortality uh, in these individuals, all cause mortality. Um, again, no significant difference, and you know that makes sense if they have um, similar kind of CD4 recovery after starting treatment. Um, so there was no significant difference in mortality um, over time between individuals with this virus and individuals without. Um, but you can see from the wide confidence intervals here that we, we had very little statistical power to look at that. Um, so there were, uh, uh, I think, 102 individuals um, in the Athena data set um, with this virus. And I think something like nine of them died over the, over the, um, the maximum of 14 years follow up we had. Um, so two things that might not make a, a lot of sense are that um, we've seen faster CD4 decline before starting treatment for individuals with this virus, um, but then there's no appreciable difference in their CD4 counts afterwards. Um, and one thing that sort of helps to understand that um, is that these individuals um, were typically put onto treatment quicker than other individuals, less time, um, you know, there was, there was a smaller delay between diagnosis and starting, uh, and starting treatment for these individuals. Um, 
Now, that might have made sense if we knew from the beginning this, that this virus was, was of concern. Of course, we didn't. We only identified this retrospectively. Um, but uh, this makes sense in turn because um, most of these individuals were diagnosed in the 2000s um, when uh, initiation on treatment was dependent on what your CD4 cell count was. And because these individuals' uh, CD4 counts were declining more quickly, they were eligible to start treatment sooner. Um, and so that has helped to mitigate the, the adverse you know, outcomes we would have expected otherwise. So what do these individuals look like um, th themselves, not just talking about the virus? Um, they're distributed over all um, regions of the Netherlands, though with a slightly different distribution to the rest of the epidemic. It's a bit more common in the southeast, um, less common in Amsterdam. Um, on the right hand side, this is just showing um, these aren't absolute counts. This is um, pretty much like a probability distribution um, just for the time of diagnosis so that you can see when that typically is for individuals with the virus and individuals without. Um, and in red, you can see the individuals with this virus were mostly diagnosed um, in the 2000s um, and it's been declining since about 2010 or a little bit earlier. Um, the plot here is the age of diagnosis. So you can see that's fairly similar. There's a, a little bit of noise uh, because we only have about 100 of these individuals, but it's fairly similar for individuals with the virus and without, they, they have pretty similar ages. Um, I'm just gonna try and, uh, I'm, I'm hiding some of my own screen behind the Zoom things. Uh, but, so I can't quite see what I've written here. Um, but they have, um, uh, in both cases, individual with the virus and without, um, uh, most of them are men who have sex with men, thought to have acquired um, the virus um, through, through male sex. Um, and most of them in, in both cases um, have their origin listed as Western Europe. Um, we don't have ethnicity or host genotype available, um, but that's the best proxy we have. Um, and so in all of these respects, the, the, the take home is that the individuals themselves appear to be very similar, whether or not they have the virus. And so the fact that the properties of infection seem different, we can, you know, with some degree of confidence, attribute to the virus itself and not to some confounding property um, of, of differences between the people. So genetic characterization, um, it's pure subtype B. Um, it's pretty different at the level of uh, more than 5%. Um, from any other subtype B we've seen in our data or in publicly uh, available data sets. Um, it doesn't appear to be uh, generated by recombination. So it doesn't look like, you know, it's half or partly like one thing we know and half like something else. It looks as though this was just a process of de novo uh, mutations accumulating over a period of time. Um, so there are lots of substitutions differing it. I was already saying 5% difference. That's about 250 amino acid substitutions, 500 uh, nucleotide changes. Um, where in the genome those mutations occur is about what you'd expect according to normal between host variability um, of HIV. So for example, there are fewer of them in poll, more of them in ENV um, in line with you know, pure, um, uh, purifying selection in poll sort of Try, trying to keep that part of the genome um, fairly constant is in the virus's benefit, whereas uh, having variability in ENV is in the virus's benefit. Um, CTL escape mutations um, and DNDS, DN by DS as a measure of selection, seem to be fairly typical. Um, I'm not going to talk in detail about um, what we did there. Um, genetically predicted co-receptor usage um, seems to be normal for subtype B uh, early in infection. So 16 of the 17 whole genomes available were CCR5 tropic. Um, it has the drug resistance mutation M41L, but on its own, that only causes low level resistance um, to one drug. So overall, this is of no concern for, for combination therapy. Um, it does have one mutation, uh, an amino acid substitution in, in the accessory gene VPR, which has previously been noted to be more common um, in uh, sort of it's it's been associated with disease progression and was shown to have quite a big effect in, in mice models but this mutation is really common overall in subtype B so it's not plausible that's the only thing that's happening here or, or we would have noticed it already um, from overall subtype B analyses. So some phylodynamic, phylodynamic analyses now um, the tree here is a beast um, MCC tree a maximum clade credibility tree um, uh, which is timed, as you can see on the x-axis, and the colours here um, indicate the region of the Netherlands, and there's also two sequences from, from Belgium and, and Switzerland, 
Um, and we know that, um, uh, of course, for the tips, they're, they're individuals. Um, we know which cohort, cohort they were from. But as we go back into the tree, we're looking at the ancestry um, uh, of those viruses back towards viruses we didn't observe in the past. And so there's an inference here of where those viruses were. Um, and that looks more and more like Amsterdam um, as we get closer to the root of this tree, so that the virus from which all of these viruses have evolved. Um, and the time to most recent common ancestor, the TMRCA, um, the posterior for that um, is labelled on here. So it looks as though this virus sort of finished evolving in, into what's typical of later viruses um, around about 1998. Uh, the bottom plot here shows um, uh, the SkyGrid effective population size. So this is indicative of the, um, the infectious, uh, the number of infectious people. Um, and that sort of roughly um, seems to be increasing until about 2010, with some signal of possibly declining after that, um, which is also um, consistent with just the, the raw number of diagnoses we've seen of people with this virus. Um, let me just check how I'm doing for time. There's one. Okay, fine. Um, so tree imbalance um, is uh, is sort of a, it's a phylogenetic metric. Um, assessing the extent to which a tree, um, uh, each time you have a bifurcation, so each, each time the tree splits, um, is it the left-hand side or the right-hand side that's more likely to continue splitting? So does the tree look like a ladder, basically, or is it pretty much symmetrical um, at, each, at each node you look at? Um, and uh, um, uh, Christoph looked at this tree and, and correctly identified that it, it, that it was imbalanced. Um, but we, um, we looked at other Dutch clusters and we found that um, most of them were as well. So it doesn't seem to be imbalanced to an unusual extent. Uh, Luca Ferretti looked at um, the local branching index um, from, from the trees we had um, for this virus. So the local branching index is a measure at any given point in the tree. You typically calculate it at the tips of the tree, but you can calculate it anywhere. It's a measure of how densely is the tree branching at that point. Um, which is a kind of measure of, of fitness of whatever organism you're talking about. So on a virus phylogeny, a measure of viral fitness. Um, and the LBI was uh, higher for, for this uh, variant compared to other, um, uh, other kinds of viruses, even adjusting for various, uh, various things. Um, and so a way you can think about that is um, the tree is, the phylogenetic tree is branching quite densely um, within, uh, within the clade of this variant. Um, which is sort of another way of saying that there's not very much evolution separating the virus of one person with this variant and another person with this variant. And we interpret that as the virus moving quickly from one person to the next. So that's why LBI here is a proxy of infectiousness. So this is sort of an indirect measure um, from which we conclude that this virus was more, uh, is more infectious, more transmissible um, than, than other variants. Uh, and Francois repeated an analysis that, um, that he did on, uh, for the whole Beehive dataset earlier on, which is looking at um, a set, a viral load evolution over a tree. So we've already identified, I mean, what I've been talking about is that the viral load for the variant as a whole um, is higher. Um, but then Francois went, uh, went back and looked at just within the, the tree um, only of this variant, is there evidence for some kind of further viral evolution? So are, uh, are some viruses that, that are this kind more virulent than others? Um, and he, and, and the re, it was a null result, basically. So, it, uh, so what that means is it looks like this higher viral load is a property of the variant as a whole and not some subset uh, of, of variants of viruses within this virus clade. Um, I think I'm still doing okay for time, so I'll just say a little bit about this. So the first, uh, the first individual to be diagnosed uh, with this virus was diagnosed in 1992. The next individual was diagnosed in 2002. Um, and that first individual had a period of um, incomplete viral suppression. They were on the, sort of a very early form of, of treatment, which wasn't combination therapy, or was you know, uh, not sort of the more effective later, later kinds of combination therapy. Um, and so we, you know, one of the hypotheses for how this, uh, this variant might have arisen is an extended period of within host evolution, the same kind of thing we're talking about for variants of SARS-CoV-2. Um, and in particular, given that there was this one in, you know, for this long period of time, we only knew of one individual with this virus, we thought 
you know, perhaps it was that particular individual. Um, the, the, the Amsterdam team went back and found some, some uh, samples in freezers from the 90s for that individual. Um, and uh, David Bonsall's lab here um, um, carefully resequenced those old, uh, those old samples. And we did a new phylogenetic analysis, including those old samples. Uh, and that actually provided evidence against that, uh, that hypothesis of within host evolution in, in that one particular person. So we did see some evolution occurring in that individual, but it basically looked like private within host evolution. So it didn't, uh, we didn't see a case of evolution accumulating over time in that person, and they then passed it on to somebody else. Um, it could easily have been the case that they were infected by, uh, by someone else, and it was that other person we didn't see who went on to, to, to spread the virus further. So it doesn't look like that individual was sort of was the source of, of evolution that we've seen. Uh, so in summary, the VB variant uh, emerged uh, in the 90s. Um, its viral load is about 0 0.5, 0 0.7 uh, log 10 copies higher. That's stable over time. Is not uh, an artifact of um, confounding by uh, age or sex. It's the same if you adjust for those. Um, CD4 cell decline is twice as fast, measured robustly using two different sources of data. Um, reaching 350 cells uh, per cubic, mil per cubic uh, millimetre uh, in, uh, in about nine months after diagnosis, in, in, on average for men in their 30s, faster for older age groups, similar for women. Um, treatment failure is not a concern. Drug resistance mutations are not a concern. We sort of, we've, we've measured the genotype. There aren't drug resistant mutations here. Um, there's, in, there's indirect phylogenetic evidence that the virus is more transmissible. Uh, similar characteristics of the individuals uh, themselves suggest that everything we're observing here is attributable to the virus, not a confounding property of the individuals. Um, of course, virological follow-up here would be great to, to try and better understand what's actually going on here. What, at the molecular level, what is different about this virus that's causing these differences we see? Um, and of course, this underlines the importance of existing guidelines that people at risk of acquiring HIV should have access to regular testing um, and the WHO guide, guidelines say that when somebody is diagnosed with HIV, they should start treatment on the very same day. So there should, there should be no delay. And this underlines that importance as, as UNAIDS um, said at the start. Um, and thank you again to um, everybody who consented to uh, give their data, um, everybody involved in Beehive, specifically to the, to the co-authors, um, and thank you for listening.